I'm Patty Simpson with Simpson Math. In this video, we're going to begin our discussion on how we collect data. So remember in statistics, what we have is some question that we want answered. And we answer it by collecting data and using that data to answer our question. So we would love to, when we are collecting data, be able to collect data from our entire population. Remember that the population is our entire group of interest. But collecting data from the entire population a lot of times takes time and money and manpower. And so it's very, very difficult to do. So instead, what we do is we just collect a sample. We collect data from part of our group of interest, and we call that a sample. And samples are collected because it is so difficult to gather data from the entire population. When we are able to gather uh, data from the entire population, we call that a census, but that's really hard to do. So we just collect samples instead. But that sometimes causes problems. What we want when we gather a sample, when we gather data from a sample, we want a representative sample. In other words, we want to gather data from a part of the, pop, from a part of the population, from a sample, that looks like the whole population. So a representative sample has the same relevant characteristics as the population. And it doesn't favor one group um, from another group of the population. So for instance, if I was interested in pecan trees in my orchard, I don't want to go out and collect data from the entire orchard. It would take me too much time. So instead, I just gather data from some of my trees. But I need to make sure that I'm gathering data from some trees from each area or trees that look alike. In other words, maybe I've got really tall trees and I've got really short trees, or maybe I have different um, types of trees. I need to make sure that I gather data from all the different types of trees I have, from tall trees and short trees, and I'm not just all my trees look alike and I'm excluding others. So a representative sample looks like your population. It's part of the population that looks like the entire population. So a statistical bias, bias in statistics is different than just the word bias that we typically think of. When we typically think of bias, we think of having some personal reason to, um, to favor one group over another. That's not how it is in, stati in statistics. Statistical bias is just the tendency of a statistic to overestimate or underestimate a parameter. In other words, when I collect data from a sample, there is a tendency for that sample to be a little different from the whole population. I want it to be representative, but it's not always exactly perfect. So there's some tendency for it to be a little bit, our statistic to be a little bit more or a little bit less than that entire probability, I mean parameter. When we have an unbiased um, statistic, that means that we've taken, if we take a bunch of statistics or a bunch of samples and we gather uh, statistics from that and we get an average of those, it'll really be uh, like the parameter, the population um, parameter. And we call that an unbiased statistic. But statistical bias is just that tendency that our statistic and our parameter are not quite the same. And some, there's some different causes of that. Sometimes there's just measurement error. When we go out and collect our data, maybe we collect the data incorrectly. I'm weighing a baby and instead of writing down nine pounds, seven ounces, I, I write down seven pounds, nine ounces. So that the data I collect, I actually record inaccurately. Or maybe I ask a question and the way I ask the question makes my um, person who's answering it not answer it correctly. Maybe not because they intended to misunderstand, um, but maybe they just misunderstood the question. 
So measurement error is one reason for statistical bias. Another reason, and up here it says that the recorded dip data just differs from the actual values. So measurement error might be caused by the way that an interviewer poses the question. Maybe it's the wording of the question. Maybe it's the way that I collected my data. Like I said, I wrote it down wrong. Or maybe it's the way that the respondent recorded their, their um, data, if I'm require, re uh, relying on them to record their data. Sometimes, though, statistical bias is because I had an unrepresentative sample. You know, I didn't realize that there was a whole group of trees that I'm missing in my population. You know, there was a group of trees that's being uh, inundated and flooded with insects. And I, when I collected my data, I didn't collect any, any data from those insect-ridden trees or whatever. So if I, if I collect data from an unrepresentative sample, then it too can cause um, statistical bias. And when I have that statistical bias, I end up with sampling error. When my statistic is not exactly the same as my parameter, I have some statistical error. And to find that statistical error, I just find the statistic minus the parameter, and that equals the error. I think there's supposed to be an S right there. Statistic minus the parameter, and that equals our error. So here's a small introduction to gathering data and some things that can happen when we have a sample, we collect a sample. Here, we're going to look at different methods for collecting data from a sample, different methods for um, finding a sample, different sample methods. And the first one we're going to look at is a convenience sample. A convenience sample is just as the name implies, it's convenient, it's easy, it's cheap, it's quick, it's nice and convenient. So that's the where it gets its name from. And you've been involved with convenience samples lots of times, whether you've realized it or not, because they are just so quick and easy. So that's one of the advantages of a um, convenience sample is that it's quick and easy and requires little um, resources. And it's collected because of the ease and the accessibility to the data. So for instance, you walk into Subway and at the end, they hand you a receipt and they say, here, call this number and let us know how we're doing. If you've ever called one of those numbers at Subway or Schlotzky's or whatever your favorite restaurant is, then you've been part of a convenient sample. That's just a nice convenient way for the, um, for the company to get information and it's cheap. They can just have a computer set up for you to enter your, your data into it. Uh, or maybe they have one person answering the phone to, to um, collect your data. It's nice and cheap. And you volunteered to collect, to provide that data to them. Uh, some other examples of just that convenience sample. If you've ever been walking down the sidewalk and somebody pulled you off the street to ask you questions or a survey, you've been part of a convenience sample. So a convenience sample is just that. It's nice and simple and easy and convenient. Maybe you go around and you ask your your the first five friends that you see some information because you want to answer some question, you want to collect some data. Asking those first few people you see, that's nice and convenient and quick and easy. So all those are examples of convenience samples. The disadvantage to a convenient sample is the fact that it might not represent the entire population. Maybe the people who volunteer, maybe the people who call in to Subway or Slotsky's have a certain characteristic that causes them to call, to call in. Like for instance, maybe the reason you're calling in is because you had a horrible experience. Man, they didn't even talk to you for the first five minutes that you walked in the store. So when you got that receipt, you were like, oh yeah, I'm gonna call. I'm gonna let them know how they're doing. Or maybe your girlfriend works at the store. And so you're like, I'm gonna call and give her a good review. Or maybe you got a really, really good review uh, bit of service. And so therefore you wanna call to let them know, hey, this was a great service. So I bet on those um, surveys, you get people who had really bad 
service and really good service and maybe sometimes not so much in between. I don't know, I haven't looked at their data, but you can see that the, when they volunteer to call in, they may have some certain characteristic that may cause them to do something like volunteer. Or maybe as you're walking down the street and somebody pulls you over to survey you, maybe you have some characteristic that makes you be chosen or um, you have some characteristic in you that makes you go talk to the surveyor that's different from the rest of the population. So sometimes our um, convenience samples are not really representative of our entire population. So that's a downfall. It causes more statistical bias. Remember that statistical bias means it's just um, our our, stat, our statistics end up not being the same as our parameter. And it might be because our sample is not like the rest of our population. Let's look at a couple of examples of the convenience sample. A country radio wants to find the average age and gender of listeners. The station chooses one weekday morning to ask listeners to call in for a contest where the winning win winner wins a free manicure pedicure at a local spa. When the listeners call in the station, the station asks their gender and age to collect data. So the winner wins a free manicure pedicure. So notice how the station's not having to do much. They have somebody manning the phone to ask them what's your gender and what's your age. But otherwise, the Callers themselves are doing the work, they're calling in. But also notice that this sample might not be like the rest of their population. For instance, maybe people who call in on a weekday morning are different from the rest of their population. So, you know, first of all, their population are all of their listeners. Maybe by having them call in on a weekday morning, you're getting old people who are just sitting around with nothing better to do listening to the radio. Or maybe you're getting a certain population that's working and so they're, they've got radio playing in their workplace. Um, maybe you're missing out on all the young people that listen to your radio station because they're all at school. Then it tells you that the winner is going to win a manicure pedicure. Maybe the people who call in are really interested in this manicure pedicure and so they're not like the rest of the population because that's what they're really interested in. So you can see that we might not get a sample that's representative of the whole population, even though this is a quick and easy way to collect our data. If the radio station wanted to get something that was more representative of the entire population, they might want to do something like do the uh, contest at various times throughout the day, not just in the morning, but also in the afternoon, also in the evening, also in the middle of the night, various days throughout the weekday to make sure that they're hitting all the different um, times of the day. They may want to vary their, their prizes up so that they're hitting a wide swath of their population to make sure that they get more representative population. So it could still be that convenience sample in that the person calls in and they just have one person answering the phone, but they could make it more representative of the entire population. Here's another example. The student government at a community college has money to spend on either equipment for the soccer club or plants for the science club's but butterfly garden. The student government conducts a survey of students by standing outside the gym and stopping students to ask their opinion. Again, they're just standing on the street and asking people who come up. So that volunteer system, it's nice and easy, nice and, and cheap. You just have to have a couple of people out there doing it. So, but again, this might not be representative of the entire population. Like what time of day are they standing out there? Maybe you get a certain um, bit of the population because of the time of day. And where are they standing? Well, they chose to stand outside the gym. So maybe they get more people who are interested in soccer equipment than they would for the butterfly garden. So you have to, this is a nice convenient sample, but if you want to reduce that statistical bias, if you want to make the, 
the sample more representative of the entire population. So you should do things like have somebody out there at multiple days, multiple times of the day, and then at various places around that community college. But you can see how in both of those situations, it's just convenient, nice and easy. First five people I see, I'm gonna look at data that from the first 10 papers that I have, something like that, where it's just nice and easy. So this is our first sampling, our first method for collecting a sample. So a systematic sample is just a method where we um, do collect the data using a system to help us out, some sort of pattern or some sort of um, periodic interval to help us to choose our data. So that's what all this says is that it's a method for collecting a sample by starting at some random point and then continuing selecting a fixed periodic interval. So let me give you an example of this. Maybe I want to find out the opinion of the people in my town on some new law that's happening. So I'd love to be able to go around town and knock on everyone's door, but I just don't have time or the, um, the manpower to do that. So instead, I choose to go knock on every third door in town and talk to the people there. Now, that would be a systematic sample. I'm, I found every third door I'm gonna go knock on in town. So the advantages to this type of sampling method is it takes less time, a little less time, and it's really efficient. I have this pattern or this method for the system for collecting my data. However, the disadvantage is that there may be some statistical bias that's introduced if the population happens to be organized in a cyclic pattern. Here's what I mean by that. In my town, we have a historic district. And in the historic district, back in the day, a long time ago, there were really big houses that were built. And maybe there were some little houses built alongside those big houses for people who helped out in the big houses. Or maybe it was just built on a lot of land and over time that land is sold. But what we have in that historic district now is a big house and a little house and a little house and a big house and a little house and a little house. And so if I went, went and knocked on every third door in that neighborhood, I might only be getting big houses because I might be only knocking on every third door where there's a big house. Or maybe I'm only getting little houses because I'm only knocking on every third door and it happens to be a little house. I need to make sure that in my method for collecting the data, that every third house has not only big houses, but also little houses as well. So I'm getting a good representation of the entire population. So that is one disadvantage is you have to watch for those cyclical patterns within the population. Here's a couple of examples of a systematic sampling, uh, systematic sample. The faculty council at a university wants to pick a sample of faculty and ask how they feel about changing instructor titles. The council gets a list of faculty and department chairs. The council interviews every 10th member on the list. So again, instead of talking to every member, we're just looking at every 10th one. We have this pattern or this system for choosing the members of the, for the sample. But the, whoever's running the survey needs to be careful and look at the list to make sure that it's not organized in some cyclical pattern. In other words, they need to make sure that every 10th member is not like a department chair. Maybe every department has 10 members and the 10th one is always the department chair. Maybe department chairs have a different idea than the rest of the faculty. Or maybe every 10th member on the list is the new hire. And so those new hires have a different um, opinion than the rest of the department, the rest of the faculty. So they just need to watch to make sure that the 10th member on the list includes department chairs and people who've been there for a while and people who've been there less time and new hires. It has a variety of people throughout the college. 
So having a method is a really good idea as long as there's not some pattern within the population. Here's another example. A gym manager wants to find the average heart rate of a member. Then the manager has the members take their heart rate every hour on the hour throughout the day. So they can't be constantly taking the heart rates of their members, but instead what he does is he has a system or pattern in place where every hour on the hour, everyone stops and takes their heart rate. But that the, again, the gym manager needs to look for cyclical patterns to make sure that he's getting a, a good representation. For instance, maybe every hour on the hour is when the classes start. And so people haven't been working out yet, and so therefore their pulse rate would be lower than it would be later in the um, hour. So they just need to watch for those types of things to make sure that they're getting a good representation of the entire population and make adjustments if they aren't. So with a systematic sample, we just have some sort of system or pattern in place to help us to choose the sample. We're gonna look at a random sample. A random sample, we collect that sample by giving every member of the population an equal chance of being chosen. Every member in the population has an equal chance of being chosen or has an equal probability of being chosen. That's what makes it a random sample, truly random. So the advantages to a random sample, the random sample is like the holy grail of the statistical world. We want to actually get a random sample where that every population member has an equal chance. And that helps us to collect an unbiased um, uh, sample so that it's very much like the population. And uh, not only is it unbiased representation of the population, but then we are able to use that, uh, use statistical methods to analyze the sample results. The disadvantages is it's difficult, sometimes impossible to actually perform or collect an actual random sample. So in order for us to collect that random sample, the first thing we have to do is know everyone within the population. And we have to be able to number those um, members of the population or give those members something so that we can equally choose them. We can choose them with an the equal likelihood. And a lot of times with large populations, we're not able to do that. We don't actually know every single member of our population. So it makes it very difficult for us to collect an actual random sample. Here's a couple, here's an example though. A company wants to determine how employees feel about a new policy. The company gets a list of all employees from the human resources department. The company gives each employee a number and uses a random number generator to choose 30 employees to ask questions of. So notice that every employee had a number and then a random number generator, a computer, or you, you can have those on your phone sometimes, where you just get an actual random number is chosen and then th that's the way those employees were chosen. They could have done it some other ways too. Maybe they take all the names of the employees and put them in a hat and mix it up and only choose from the hat or every, um, uh, on a lotto balls in a big lotto machine, every employee's name goes on a lotto ball and they come out on a, uh, just randomly there. Or maybe they can roll a dice to help them to determine so that it truly is an equal chance for each member of the population. But you can see that as if I know all of the employees, then I can number all those employees. Or if I wanted data from all of my students, well, I could give numbers to all my employees students. Or if I had an orchard, maybe I could number all the trees in my, nor in my orchard and then just choose the ones, let the number generator choose which trees. But if I'm looking at fish in, the, in a lake, I can't number all the fish in the lake. I don't know what fish are out there. So I can't actually get a random sample of the fish in the lake. I need to find a new way to be able to have an equal chance of those fish being chosen. So uh, that's an example of a random sample.
let's look at a stratified sample method. In order for it to be a stratified sampling method, we, a researcher divides population into separate groups, which we call strata. Then a probability sample is drawn from each group. Anytime I see this word strata or stratified, for some reason, I think of uh, dirt. Like I picture the dirt of a mountain, different layers of that dirt. And a stratified sample, we do the same thing. We layer or have groups within our population. And then I picture a big bulldozer or something coming down and drilling a drill, drilling down through those layers of dirt and then grabbing uh, dirt from every one of those layers. And that would be a stratified sample. We've divided the dirt into different layers and then we've come down and grabbed part a sample, a piece of each one of those layers. And that's exactly what a stratified sample does. We divide our population into separate groups and then choose a few members from every one of those groups. Now, there are a lot of advantages to using a stratified sample. A stratified sample can help to reduce the selection bias so that our sample is very representative of our population and it helps to, to ensure that a sample accurately reflects that population. And we can even make it more specific. Sometimes we can do something called a proportionate stratified sample, where each one of our sample, uh, our groups is proportionate. So if this group is made up of 50% of my whole population, then in my sample, I choose 50% of my sample from that group. And if this group over here is just a tiny piece of my population, it's only 2% of my population, then in my sample, I would only have 2% from that, from that sample or from that strata. So we can, we can even divide up the strata even more, um, more carefully in that manner so that it really does reflect the population. The disadvantages though to a stratified um, uh, method is that the researchers must identify every member in the population to classify them into groups. So if you're looking at um, a certain, um, maybe the dirt, and you don't realize that there's a layer down below that you've missed, well, then you may not grab all the dirt from all the different layers. Or if you're looking at people, maybe you miss an entire ethnic group of, of your population. So that is one difficulty with the stratified sample is to make sure that you've included all the groups. So here are a couple of examples of stratified samples. Suppose a research team wants to determine the average number of hours a student studies for a test. The team divides the students into majors and chooses a few students from each major. So in this case, the strata are the majors. The groups they've divided them into are the majors. And they've chosen a few students from every group. They chose a few students from every one of those majors. And that's what makes it a stratified sample. Now they do have to make sure that they've included all of the majors. That's the one thing that the researchers need to be careful of. Here's another example. Researchers want to determine nurses' willingness to care for patients infected with HIV. The researchers divide the nurses by the amount of experience, zero to two years, two to five years, five to 10 years, more than 10 years, and choose a random sample of nurses from each experience level. So their experience level, or the number of years they've worked, that are the strata, those are the groups and they're choosing a few nurses from every one of those groups. So a stratified sample, we divide our population into groups and choose a few members from each of the groups. In this case, we're gonna look at a cluster sample. A cluster sample, a researcher divides the population into different groups or clusters and a few of those groups or clusters are chosen. Then data is collected from every member of those few groups. 
So I always think of like a peanut cluster, you know, they have the, or a pecan cluster where it's a chocolate with a bunch of different little pieces of pecan. They're clusters, so they're little groups of pecans or peanuts in the chocolate. And I'm always trying to watch my weight, and so I only eat part of it. I maybe eat half of the, um, of the peanut cluster. But of those peanut clusters, I eat a few groups, but I eat the entire peanut from those few groups. So it helps me remember what, what a cluster um, sample is. Here, the advantage to the, the cluster sample because it's fairly economical and it's fairly practical. In other words, it takes a little bit less time and a little less resources to go into certain clusters. But the disadvantages is that there's a high possibility of sampling error because we may leave out significant portions of the population so that our sample is not representative or is not like our entire population. So it causes some sampling error. And the reason for this is because like tends to like. Think about in your town. Think about in the town that you live in. I bet you can say on the north side of town, such and such happens. Like for instance, in the town I'm in, I live on the north side. Well, on the north side, when we think of the north side, it's old people. This, is, this um, uh, neighborhood is well established. And so a lot of people have, have uh, had houses here for a long time. And so there are a lot of uh, old people that live in this portion of the neighborhood. Whereas if we go out to the west side of town, there are new houses being built out there. And there are families that are newer families, younger families in that portion of town. Think about your town, I bet it's the same way. I bet you can say in this side of town, it's this type of person. In this side of town, it's this type of person. So it tends, it tends to, in populations where like tend to like. In other words, the, if they have the same characteristics, they seem to be drawn to one another. Turns out that's even going to be true in nature, where trees may grow uh, in a certain area. You know, their soil may be richer, so they're taller. Whereas in another area, all the trees may be shorter. Or a certain type of fish may hang out in one part of the pond, where another type of fish hangs out in the other type of the pond. So that's the problem with our cluster um, samples is that when we start to look and divide them into groups, if we only choose a few of those groups, we may be choosing all one type of fish or one, all one type of person or all one type of tree. So it tends to um, lead to some sampling error. So let me give you some examples of cluster samples. A researcher is interested in data about city taxes in Florida. The researcher randomly chooses a few cities from the state. You can see how that would be more economical and practical to just go to a few cities instead of going to every single city in the state of Florida. That would be more difficult. So they've divided it into clusters, their cities, and they're just going to choose a few cities randomly using a number generator or maybe a, a dice or something to help choose those cities. Then once the cities are chosen, the researchers collect tax information from every house in those cities. So because we have a few groups, but every house is chosen from them, that is a cluster sample. But again, you can see the bias that might occur or the sampling error that might occur because maybe the cities that are chosen all have the same characteristics. Their taxes are all the same and some parts of the population might be left out. A researcher wants to evaluate the earnings of airport staff in the United States. The researcher randomly selects 30 airports from the appro approximate 5,200 airports and records the earnings of all the employees at each of those 30 airports. So again, the researchers divided this into groups, airports, and then chosen a few airports. They're not going to all of them, just a few airports. But at those airports, they're going to look at every single employee at those few airports. 
and collect data from those. And that's what makes it a cluster sample. When we choose a few groups and look at every member within that group, then it's a cluster sample. Now the difference between the cluster method for collecting a sample and the stratified method is really subtle. Let's look at the differences now. In both cases, we divide the population into groups. In one case, we call them clusters, and in the other, we call them strata. Typically, the clusters are more geographic um, divisions, whereas the strata are more based upon attributes, but it doesn't have to be that way. In a cluster sample, the data is gathered from a few of those groups. So we've divided the population into multiple groups. In a cluster, we only choose data from a few of the groups. Whereas in a stratified uh, sample, da data is collected from every group, every one of those strata. In the cluster sample, data is gathered from every member within a few of the groups. So we've divided the population into a few uh, into groups. We choose a few of those groups and look at every member in those groups. Whereas in the stratified, we go to every single group and just choose a few members from every group. To help me in my head keep it straight, which is which, I kind of picture a mountain and a peanut cluster, you know, a, a chocolate that has, um, well, pecans, actually, a pecan cluster in it. I know my artwork's not great, but play along with me. So here we have a mountain, and in it there are different layers of dirt, or strata of dirt. And the way I picture it is that some um, drill comes along and collects from the top all the way down, collects a portion, a sample of that data from every single one of those strata. So we're going to get a little bit of dirt from every single one of those groups. Whereas in the pecan cluster, I'm going to eat some of my pecan cluster. And so I'm only choosing a few of the groups. But when I choose a few of the groups, I'm going to look at the entire group. So I'm going to eat that whole pecan, so the whole thing goes. So here, we look at every group and choose a little from every group. In this case, I choose a few groups and take the whole group. So that's the difference between our stratified sample and our cluster sample. There's more differences than that. Statistically, we would prefer to have a stratified sample than a cluster sample. We, we looked at some of those differences in a previous um, video where stratified does a better job of getting a representative portion of the population. Whereas cluster, because light tends to like, it's not always representative of the entire population. We have a tendency to leave out parts of the population. That's the difference between a cluster and a stratified sample. There are many different ways to choose a sample from a population. We've just looked at a few of the most popular ways that we can do that, that we can choose part of our population to collect data from. The ones we learned about were convenience. It's a nice, easy to collect the data, volunteers, or we're standing on the street corner asking the first five people that come up, something that's right at our fingertips that's easy to collect. Systematic has a nice pattern um, for collecting the data. It's every 10th one or every hour on the hour. Stratified, we take our population, divide it into groups. We go to every group and collect data from a few members of every group. Cluster, we divide the population into groups, choose a few groups and collect data from every member of those groups. And then random, every single member of our, pop, of our sample has an equal chance, or every member of the population has an equal chance of being chosen as part of our sample. They have a, a, an equal chance, an equal probability. And that's what makes it truly random. 
So each one of our, our um, different sample methods has its advantages and its disadvantages. Each one of them has a reason that we might choose to do it that way and, uh, or choose not to do it that way. Sometimes we end up actually overlapping the methods where we'll do more than one. Um, in order to choose our cluster, our groups from our cluster, maybe we use a random sample in order to do that. Or we may use uh, stratified and then use a systematic method to choose the members from within the group. So sometimes those methods actually overlap. And these are not an exhaustive, li uh, exhaustive list of all the different methods. There are many, many other ways to choose a sample from a population. Again, these are just some of the most popular ways. When we choose our sample, the larger the sample size, typically the better. Larger sample sizes typically better represent the whole population. They look more like the population if you get a bigger sample size. You're less likely to leave out part of your population. But large sample sizes that leave out a whole swath of the population are not as good as small sample sizes that are very representative of the population. It's just that typically larger sample sizes are better. And then remember that we use a capital N to denote the population size, and we use a lowercase n to, to denote a sample size. So anytime you see this capital N, you know that we're talking about the size of the entire group that we're looking at, that whole population. Whereas a lowercase n tells me how many members are actually in my sample, how many I collected data from. So, Collecting samples is really, really important because most of the time we can't get to the entire population. And these are just a few of the different methods um, in order to collect those samples. Math made simple, it's some math. Thanks for watching.